Eliska Elsie Peraubuk, 1906-1911, was a Czech-American girl who was a victim of kidnapping and murder in the spring of 1911. Her disappearance and the subsequent search for her preoccupied Illinois, Wisconsin and Minnesota law enforcement for six weeks. Her funeral was attended by between 2,000 and 3,000 people. The story of the girl's death, and especially her photograph in the Chicago Daily News, were inspirations for Henry Darger's immense fantasy novel, The Story of the Vivian Girls. Background Eliska was born in Chicago in 1906. Her mother, Carolina Vojakova, was born on the 26th of November 1869 in Mykov House 8, formerly part of the Kaslov district of Bohemia, Austria-Hungary, now part of the Kurudim district of the Czech Republic, the daughter of peasants Joseph Vojacek and Frantiska Korakova. Elsie's father, Frantisek, Frank, Perubek was a laborer, born on the 15th of December 1867 in Podhora Uranova House 3 to Jan Perubek and Katerina Bartak Ova from the Havlikov Broad area. Frank supposedly first came to the U.S. in 1882 at the age of 14 or 15. He returned to the Podhorny area and married Carolina in her village in 1892, bringing her to America around 1895. Several close relatives also moved to Chicago. In the United States, Frank worked as a painter while Carolina maintained the home. Eliska Elsie was their seventh child. In newspaper accounts, particularly in the Chicago Daily News, Perubek is frequently spelled Perubek. Frank is sometimes referred to as Peter or John, and Carolina is sometimes called Mary. Elsie is also called Mary or Emily in the Rockford, Illinois newspapers. Disappearance on the morning of April 8, 1911, Elsie Perubek left her home at 2320 South Albany Avenue in Chicago, telling her mother she was going to visit our auntie, Carolina's sister Julia Trampoda, around the corner at 2325 S. Troy Street. Turning left on 22nd Street and left again on Troy, she encountered her nine-year-old cousin, Josie Trampoda, and a number of other children who were listening to an organ grinder a short distance from Mrs. Trampoda's gate. When the organ grinder moved to the 23rd Saint Corner, the children followed him, but subsequently left while Elsie remained behind. Several hours later, Elsie's mother went to her sister's house to find Elsie had never arrived. As Elsie had many friends in the area, the women assumed she was visiting at another home, perhaps to spend the night and return the next morning. At 9 p.m. that evening, Frank Barubek returned from work and went to police at the Hinman Street station to report her missing. Police initially agreed that she was likely spending the night with friends, but when she had not returned by the following morning, Captain John Mahoney took personal charge of the search. Romani people, as identified by the Rockford, Illinois press, were suspected after a neighborhood child, John Jarowski, told detectives from the Maxwell Street station led by Inspector Stephen K. Healy that he had seen a gypsy wagon on Kedzie Avenue, a block west of Troy Street, with two women holding a little girl. The Chicago American repeated this story with the added detail that the girl seemed to be trying to get away and was being restrained. Also, that police had reason to believe this was a black hand kidnapping. There were several camps along the Des Plaines River near Kadzi and these were searched. Residents told investigators that one wagon had decamped and left on the morning of April 9th. The stolen by gypsies theory gained credence because Elsie's disappearance was almost identical to that of Lillian Wolf, who had been found with gypsies four years earlier. Elsie's father, Frank Barubek offered his life savings, $50, about $1,165 today, as a reward. Inspector Healy also ordered that drainage canals be dragged for the child's body on April 15, and Governor Charles S. Deneen asked the public to aid in the search. It was at about this time that Elsie's friend Emma Kubat, 14, told police she had last seen Elsie with the organ grinder. Detectives from the Maxwell Street station searched the Italian Quarter at West 14th and S. Halstead Streets, 
where it had been reported a child answering Elsie's description had been seen with an organ grinder. A full length photo of Elsie appeared on the front page of the April 12th Chicago American. This photo, enhanced by artists, reappeared many times in the paper. On April 17th, it was accompanied by photos of Frank, Carolina, and Elsie's sister Julia. Investigation Detectives Joseph, Comeris, and Sheehan accompanied Frank Perubeck in his search for the departed wagon, which was initially believed to be headed for Round Lake, Illinois, a village about 50 miles northwest of Chicago, where seven wagons were camped. Farmers in the area were alerted to be on watch. When local residents started asking gypsies about Elsie and attempting to search the wagons, they broke camp again and moved on to Volo, Illinois, 43 miles from Chicago. Vola residents reported a child matching Elsie's description and said she appeared to be stupefied or drugged and partly covered with a blanket. They also attempted to search the wagons, but the gypsies immediately broke camp and departed for McHenry, Illinois, about 60 miles northwest of Chicago. When police caught up with them at McHenry, they discovered the little girl was a gypsy and did not match Elsie's description. Meanwhile, Police Captain Mahoney assigned men to drag the drainage canals near Elsie's home on April 12th and again on the 15th.In several instances, a child was found in a camp who did resemble Elsie, such that even Frank was momentarily certain it was his daughter and it would take some time to convince him it was a mistake. As late as April 24th, when a little girl somewhat answering Elsie's description was found in a gypsy camp near 18th and South Halstead Streets, Frank fell to his knees and prayed that the reason for her capture was attributed by police to the natural love of the wandering people for blue-eyed, yellow-haired children. Elsie was consistently described as small, with light golden hair and blue eyes, wearing a red one-piece dress, lace shoes, shoes with laces rather than buttons and black stockings. The little girl is described as having long curly golden hair, blue eyes, and pink chubby cheeks with a prominent dimple in each. At the time she disappeared, she wore a red hat, a red dress, black stockings, and high top black boots. Chicago Daily News, April 12, 1911. She was a very pretty child and passing strangers often stopped to pass admiring comment upon her. Rockford Daily Gazette, April 21, 1911. On April 17, Police Captain Mahoney received an anonymous phone tip that a child answering Elsie's description had been seen accompanying a man to a Western Springs, Illinois, hotel. Again, detectives dispatched to the hotel found nothing. Sycamore, Illinois, Police Chief Ogden accompanied Frank Perubeck to investigate gypsy wagons at Cherry Valley, Illinois, but found no child even remotely resembling Elsie. Meanwhile, Hinman Street Police fielded reporters' questions about a $500, nearly $13,000 in 2015 ransom note received by Carolina. They denied official knowledge of the communication, but admitted it might be true. On April 20th, Neighbors saw Frank Jr., age 6, lugging a pick and shovel out into South Troy Street and start digging. Upon inquiry, Frank said there had been a lot of construction on the street the day Elsie disappeared, and he had heard his parents discussing the possibility that she had fallen into a hole. As she struggled to climb out, she might have been buried under falling sand and gravel. Workers still fixing the street said that it was possible, but they would have noticed immediately. Meanwhile, people in the West End and a woman in Kings, Illinois, reported sightings of light-skinned girls traveling with gypsies. In the second week after Elsie's disappearance, Lillian Wolf, age 11, came forward to offer assistance. Wolf herself had been the subject of a similar manhunt four years earlier. She had been stolen by gypsies and held for six days, working as a beggar, 
until discovered walking behind a gypsy wagon by a farmer outside Moments, Illinois. She provided details of her experience of the culture's typical behavior and volunteered to lead a rescue party. One of the men who had kidnapped Lillian suggested asking Elijah George, who, he said, was king of the gypsies. Elijah George was found in Argyle, Wisconsin, and was brought to Joliet but failed to give the desired information, and was released. At that point, Inspector Healy again ordered the drainage canal dragged, along with a search of all wells and other places where else he could have fallen. Oh, on April 22, Governor Deneen released a front-page statement to the Chicago American calling on every person to aid in the search. Also on April 22, John Mutz, the town marshal for Trevor, Wisconsin, received a phone call regarding a blonde child in a nearby gypsy camp. Mutz, along with saloon keeper Carl Jzdenek of Lyons, Illinois, met with the girl and Jzdenek said he was able to speak with her in check and verify that she was Elsie. A Mrs. Alice Gould of nearby McHenry also identified the child as Elsie and said that gypsies had attempted to steal other children in the area. By April 23rd, Lieutenant John Costello of the Hinman Street Station told reporters that every kidnapping clue had been exhausted. He was sure Elsie had been attacked and mistreated, was now dead, and her body hidden in the cellar of an empty house or deserted barn. He brought detectives to begin investigating empty buildings, barns, sheds, elevators, catch basins, and basements on or near South Albany Avenue. Several of the detectives brought spades, planning to dig in every plot of earth that appeared to have been recently disturbed. Inspector Healy joined in this search along with Detectives Perry and Egan. At the same time, Costello sent two officers to the outskirts of the city on a lead which he had received by telephone but refused to reveal to reporters. Captain Stephen Wood of the Detective Bureau was having all gypsy wagons followed and wrote to every police official in the vicinity of Belvedere, Rockford and Jonesville, Wisconsin to be on the lookout for Elsie. However, he too was now certain Elsie was either being held for ransom, had been in an accident and was either dead or in some hospital, unable to speak, or had been slain by some degenerate from one of the shanties in the alley near her home. Also on April 23rd, a neighbor told police that she had last seen Elsie around 11 a.m. on the morning she disappeared, still with the organ grinder and engaged in conversation with a man on the opposite side of the street whom the neighbor did not know. The following day's Chicago Daily News devoted a full column to the search, calling it one of the most extensive and far-reaching quests ever made for a missing child. Twenty police officers and 100 volunteers were involved in Lieutenant Costello's search, covering a radius of about a mile of the Perubeck home. It was judged to be one of the most remarkable investigations of its kind because of the intense public interest, but also due to the huge number of child volunteers. Many described themselves not just as casual acquaintances or playmates, but as friends of Elsie. These children offered to look into out-of-the-way places for Elsie or evidence leading to her whereabouts. Oh, on April 29, Inspector Healy sent a detective to Zion City, Illinois, in response to a long-distance phone tip from the Zion City Deputy Sheriff. Again, a child resembling Elsie was seen in a gypsy camp. And again the child was found to be a gypsy. By April 30th, the superintendent of schools, Mrs. Ella Flagg Young, had requested that all school children in the Chicago area organize neighborhood searches during spring break. Meanwhile, Frank Barubek, in desperation, consulted a psychic who said that Elsie was in Argo, Wisconsin possibly meaning to say Argyle, Wisconsin. Chicago politician Charles J. Vopica sent officers to the area she indicated, to no avail. The search jumped from Illinois to Wisconsin, and from Wisconsin to Minnesota, and then back again to Illinois, with no luck. A few days after Elsie's disappearance, Frank Perubeck began to receive anonymous, insulting letters. They were all written in English, which he could not read, so he asked neighbors to translate.
The letters claimed that Elsie was hidden away by someone who hated the Perual books, accusing them of mistreating her. Frank was so infuriated by the accusation that he burned the letters. Nonetheless, Detectives Zahauer and Zalaski attempted to follow up on this lead. The Czech community rallied to support the Perubex. All Czech-speaking policemen were put into plain clothes and assigned to the investigation. The Chicago American revealed that not only Czech speakers were involved in this international squad, but police officers Ogolski, Polish, Ahrens and Richter, German, Macaulay, Irish, and Alexander, English, were assigned because they each spoke several languages and would be better able to question every man, woman, and child in the camps. The women's auxiliary of the club Bohemia assisted in the search, creating an endless chain letter which was mailed to all parts of the city, with a request for recipients to mail copies to everyone they knew. Various Czech-American politicians became involved. The Bohemian Charitable Association conferred with Mayor Carter Harrison, Jr. on April 22, then announced they would offer a reward of $500, nearly $13,000 today and however much more could be raised. Mayor Harrison contributed $25, a little under $600 today and sent out a special police squad from City Hall. A detachment also operated out of the Lawndale Avenue station in cooperation with the Hinman Street Police. Anton Cermak, then a Chicago alderman, said that if Miss Perubeck were not found by the time of the next city council meeting May 1st, he would call upon the city council to offer an even larger reward. At that time, state laws did not allow the offering of a reward for the apprehension of kidnappers as it did for murderers. On April 26, Governor Deneen said he planned to ask the legislature to revise the statutes so that a reward could be offered by the state of Illinois in addition to the personal reward fund. Judge Adolph J. Sabath held several interviews with Elsie's family and also contributed $25, a little under $600 today, to the reward fund. By May 2nd, he had increased his contribution to $100 around $2,500 in 2015 and arranged meetings with Czech societies to find ways to increase the fund. Many sightings of girls in a red dress living in a gypsy camp were phoned into police and followed up. By May 1st, police had all but abandoned the idea that she had been stolen by gypsies and were returning their efforts to searching wells and dragging canals. Judge Sabbath objected saying that the police hunt was becoming listless because Elsie's parents were poor. He was being swamped with mail, most of it containing contributions to the reward fund, from all over the country, and increased his personal contribution to $100 around $2,500 in 2015 as well. Among the letters was one from Dr. G.T. Screetund of Carlisle, Arkansas which read in part, Dear Judge, in relation to the strange disappearance of Elsie Perovac, I will say that a band of 40 gypsy men and 4 gypsy women with 18 children ranging in age from 3 months to 18 years were seen in the Union Station at Little Rock, Arkansas last week. All these children looked as if they were not of gypsy parentage. Meanwhile, detectives Zahauer and Zalaski sought a man residing near Madison and Groby Streets, the suspected author of the anonymous, threatening letters Frank Perubek had received. Lieutenant Costello, supported by Inspector Healy, flatly declared, Elsie Perubek fell into the drainage canal from the Kedzie Avenue bridge or near it. She was not murdered. They believed the author of the letters to have witnessed this. By May 7, 25 gypsy bands had been searched and many false leads followed. Police Captain Mahoney announced his belief that Elsie was dead and that police would continue to search for her body. Also on May 7, Judge Sabbath ordered an investigation of Frank and Carolina themselves in search of anything in their past that might have caused someone to kidnap Elsie. Discovery. Two days later on May 9, 1911, electrical engineer George T. Scully and other employees of the Lockport Power Plant near Joliet, 35 miles outside of Chicago, saw a body floating in the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal. At first, 
They thought it was an animal from one of the nearby farms, but three hours later, realizing it was a human being, sent out a boat to bring it to shore. Undertaker William Goodale, examining the body, said that it appeared to fit Miss Brualbuck's description. The description tallied to the shade of the hair, the texture of the stockings, and the stuff and tint of the dress of little Elsie. He thought the body had been in the water for several weeks, although only slightly decomposed. Another report indicated that her body was badly decomposed, but there were no marks of violence on her body. Goodale notified Chicago authorities who sent police Lieutenant Costello to the Peruback home. Carolina Peruback cried, Midra had died. My dear child, and begged to be told Elsie was alive. Frank was taken to the Goodale funeral home at midnight. He said, The clothes look like Elsie's. But the face, I can't recognize it. Her mother alone can tell. Another newspaper reported that Frank immediately said, That's Elsie, and began to cry. Carolina arrived at the funeral home by trolley car the following morning and positively identified Elsie, saying, It's you, my darling. Thank God we've found you and you're not in the hands of the gypsies. For the next hour, she paced or sat nervously in an adjoining room with Frank holding her hands, weeping, and praying. Goodale, who had kept track of the disappearance in the papers, made this statement to police. The body appears to have been in the water for about a month, which would tally with the date of Elsie Peru Albuquerque's disappearance. The child, when she left home, was without hat, and her clothing tallies in every respect with that found on the dead body. There was no ring or other ornament, and in that respect, the descriptions correspond, excepting only as to the color of the eyes, which cannot be clearly observed as to color, the descriptions are identical. Arrangements were quickly made for an inquest. The jury consisted of F.W. Worst, Christian Raggiero, John A. Walter, William Woodale, Edwin Murray, and Patrick O'Brien. Coroner William Wonderlick of Will County officiated. As the post MORTEM examination began, Frank Barubek was the first witness. Disregarding questions put to him by the coroner, Frank plunged into charges. His daughter had been murdered. Through a translator, he asserted, I am sure the gypsies stole my girl, and then when they knew we were after them, they killed her and threw her body into the canal. At this, Carolina ran from the funeral parlor screaming, My Elsie is dead. She was murdered, murdered. Her husband and dead. Zelaski tried to calm her, but in her extreme distress she began running up and down the street, drawing a crowd of curious onlookers. She insisted she had known for three weeks that the gypsies had killed Elsie. Frank consoled her and assisted her boarding the trolley car for home. Meanwhile, the coroner said, This case has attracted such attention that a minute examination will be made. We will be content with no perfunctory inquest such as this. The jury will refuse to state its convictions, for it has none, until after the autopsy has been held. We want the stomach of the little girl examined, and the lungs as well. The father charges murder. It is certainly possible that he is right. Two physicians. E. A. Kingston and W. R. Paddock confirmed that there was no water in her lungs, so she had not drowned. Kingston said she had been attacked, often a euphemism for rape, and murdered before her body was thrown into the water. Paddock said there was every evidence she had been wounded before being killed. Lieutenant Costello later told the press that she had been mistreated, seeming to indicate this meant her death was not the work of gypsies. And Inspector Healy added, There seems to be no doubt that she was abused in the most fiendish way, and that fact established, the case is much simplified for the police. They also found deep cuts on the left side of her face. Although these men reported blue marks on the throat as though the victim had been choked. Another examination by DRS. E.R. LeCount and Warren H. Hunter of the coroner's office revealed that Elsie had been suffocated not strangled, and there were no distinct marks of violence on the body. Despite this, 
Newspaper headlines reporting the coroner's findings continued to report Elsie is strangled. The official cause of death was marked unknown. Coroner Peter Hoffman concurred with Mr. Perubeck as to the probable circumstances of Elsie's death. It is our belief that the abductor of the child suffocated her to death, possibly by putting a hand over her mouth. The coroner's report recommended that officials continue to investigate. Inspector Healy immediately detailed detectives to find out exactly what had happened. He told the Chicago Interocean, I have 40 detectives at work today on the theory that the criminals lived in the neighborhood of the Perubeck home. We are investigating every incident of the lives of the Perubecks since they came to Chicago in order to trace a possible enemy. It will surprise me if the criminals are not arrested within a week. To the Chicago Tribune he stated, We have one or two theories, but nothing specific enough to even talk about. I intend to place more men on the case tomorrow. Lieutenant Costello returned to investigating the anonymous letters. Meanwhile, the New York Times reported Hoffman's and Peralbeck's theory as fact. On the evening of May 9, Carolina was calmer and gave an interview upon returning home. Surrounded by friends and neighbors, she told reporters, before the doctors found that Elsie's lungs were free from water and discovered reasons for believing she had been strangled, I knew she had been murdered. A picture of the crime has been in my mind since the second week of her disappearance, and I am convinced that when the truth is known, as it surely will be, it will be shown that she was choked to death a week from April 8 when she was kidnapped on her way to visit her R.N.T. Carolina called upon authorities to find and punish the killers. Following the inquest, Elsie's body was brought home. Her uncle Frank Trampoda took charge of the funeral arrangements. Carolina told Judge Sabbath that the search had exhausted the family's savings and they had no money to bury her. Judge Sabbath gave her a check for $25 promising to raise more funds. Friends and family members continued to collect money for the Peruback Fund. Mrs. Sophie Johans raised over $50 by giving a benefit party and soliciting donations from Bohemians on the West Coast. Funeral Elsie Peru Albuck's funeral was held at 10 a.m. on May 12, 1911 on the lawn of the Perubex home and attended by between 2,000 or 3,000 people. The Chicago Interocean newspaper, however, gave the number of attendees as 5,000. Hours before the ceremony, Albany Avenue in the Perubex backyard, along with the balconies and porches of nearby houses, were filled with mourners. There was no hall in the neighborhood large enough to hold them all. Frank had been offered the use of a hall, but he indicated the huge gathering and said, They have come to say goodbye to my Elsie. Don't let them be disappointed. Reserves from the Hinman Street station were called in to keep order and prevent the crowd from breaking down the fence. Elsie's white coffin rested on two brass stands, surrounded by lilies of the valley. Roses and carnations sent by Mayor Harrison, Judge Sabbath and other city officials. Eight little girls dressed all in white, including Josie Trampoda and her sister Mary, brought out huge sprays of lilies and roses and encircled the beer. Someone brought two chairs out of the Perubeck home, set them near the casket, and laid a board across them to hold the hundreds of floral offerings. Carolina was seated at the head of the coffin, while Frank and the other children stood nearby. As the Perubeks were not Catholics but free thinkers, there were no prayers, and the service was read by Rudolf Jeremy Senka, editor of the Bohemian Chicago Daily's Forenost. He spoke of the need to cooperate with police to find Elsie's killers. As the undertaker went to lift the coffin into the hearse, Carolina begged him to open it so she could see Elsie's face once more, but her relatives persuaded her not to insist on this and led her away. Most of the attendees followed Elsie's casket to Bohemian National Cemetery, where Sanko gave another address. Frank Barubek was quoted as saying, my little girl is at rest and nothing matters to her now, but I shall never rest until I see her murderers paying the penalty for taking her life. Police Chief John McWeeny vowed to devote the entire Chicago police force to finding the killer.
Alderman Cermak asked Governor Deneen to increase the reward by $200, as is possible under the statutes. Cermak said, I will also ask the governor to issue a proclamation calling upon all the people of the state to interest themselves in this case in order that her murderer be apprehended. Coroner Peter Hoffman started a public reward fund, contributing dollar two five dot considering where else he was found. Detectives suspected the actual killer might be Joseph Conage. According to the Rockford Republic, Connett was definitely identified as the killer by detectives under the command of police Captain Wood. Described as a bearded bohemian and a hermit peddler, he was said to have frequently enticed little girls to his heart by the drainage canal on West 33rd Street and South Kedzie Avenue, about a mile and a half from Elsie's home, and had frequently been seen near the Perubeck home. Searching the shack, Detectives found a green hair ribbon which they intended to take to Carolina for identification, along with indications of a small hole dug in the ground and an old hemp sack which might have contained the body. The owner of the shack, Mrs. David Shaughnessy advised police that she had complained to Connach about his bringing children around the house and had evicted him on May 9th. Connett threw himself in front of a train on May 10th. Five days later he was cleared of any wrongdoing. Oh, on May 13th, the body of a well-dressed man was found in the canal at Willow Springs, some 20 miles from Lockport and 14 miles from Albany Avenue. He had no identification, only a Catholic holy card with a prayer in Polish, with the words Sig. Off written on it. Detectives believe this man also may have had some connection with Elsie's death. An anonymous letter was said to have been received by the detectives. The writer described having seen a little girl walking along the canal with a young man the day Elsie disappeared. On the same day, another loner living in a shack by the canal was identified as a possible person of interest. Mr. Kinsella, described as a religious enthusiast, was supposed to be demented. When he saw Detectives Gormley, Slad, and Fronicky approaching his home, he took off running, making a move as if to draw a revolver. Calling out that they only wanted to question him, the officers fired their weapons into the air. After a three-mile chase through gullies and underbrush, Kinsella escaped into the forest. Oh, and May 15th, Frank Perubeck told police he had spoken to a man he did not know who told him he had seen Elsie late in the afternoon of April 8 on Kedzie Avenue, south of 28th Street, long after she was supposed to have been taken by the gypsies. Lieutenant Costello assigned detectives to find the man. The previous reported sighting of Elsie had her walking toward the canal on South Troy Street, a half block south of her aunt's house. If the unknown man told the truth, Elsie was only three blocks away from a bridge. Despite the coroner's findings, Lieutenant Costello had become convinced that Elsie's death was an accident and that she had simply fallen into the canal, although Inspector Healy had had the canals and drainage ditches dragged repeatedly during the search. Coroner Hoffman continued to insist Elsie was murdered. Apparently some confusion had occurred during the initial examinations. The first physician, probably Dr. Kingston, to examine Elsie on the night of May 9th told Lieutenant Costello that she had drowned, with no marks of abuse, and Costello had repeated this when he spoke to the family. However, the following day, the same physician's autopsy findings concluded Elsie had not drowned and that she appeared to have been suffocated. Detectives surrounded a house near Madison and Roby Streets and threw a dragnet over the southwestern side of town for a former boarder in the Perubeck home. They continued to search for the anonymous writer of the nasty letters received by Frank Perubeck. Apparently neither the boarder, the writer, or the unknown man who had spoken to Frank were ever found. No one knows what really happened to Elsie Perubeck. Two years later, on the anniversary of Elsie's funeral, Frank Perubeck died. He was 45 years old. Carolina lived until December 9, 1927. Both are buried with Elsie in Bohemian National Cemetery. 
Legacy Although Elsie's mysterious disappearance and death were once the subject of intense police investigation and journalistic focus, her story faded into obscurity until the death of Henry Darger in 1973. Michael Bonesteel, an art historian examining Darger's work, found repeated reference in Darger's story of the Vivian Girls novel to Annie Arenberg, leader of a child slave rebellion, and to an inspirational picture of her that had been lost. Miss Arenberg had met a shocking yet heroic death at the hands of her captors. The murder is described in detail, and is nothing like Elsie's death. According to his diary, Darger really had lost a picture of a little girl and was desperate to get it back or replace it. He did not give the name but said it had appeared in the Chicago Daily Noise sick May, June, or July, 1911. Bonesteel's search in the newspaper archives revealed Elsie Perubeck and her story. A portrait of Annie Arenberg by Darger shows a somewhat older blonde-haired girl. Her hair ribbon and the distinctive collar of her dress are similar to Elsie's in the photograph. In the novel, Darger describes children who are kidnapped and mistreated by adults, while the heroic little Vivians, Annie Arenberg and others form rescue squads to save them. See also List of Solved Missing Persons Cases List of Unsolved Murders References External links Elsie at WebSleuths.com Elsie Perubeck at Find a Grave